fresh from the marriage of Iphis and Ionte, one that ended on a fairly happy scene of a marriage, of a wedding, we follow the god of marriage, Hymen, uh, to another wedding, one that is a little bit less uh, happy. Um, <clears throat> in the process, we cross over into Book 10, which is going to further develop and uh, consider these themes of some uh, decadence, even depravity, depending on, uh, on where you're coming from this, but certainly this consideration of certain uh, social practices and the idea of sexuality and sexual frustration and sexual um, morphing, if you will, uh, that uh, that Ovid is likely seeing in the Roman character in great contradistinct contradistinction to the Augustan view of good, solid, conservative family values. Okay. Uh, the wedding in question is, uh, is between Orpheus and Eurydice. Orpheus is the son of Apollo and one of the, uh, one of the muses, I think Calliope, and he is known because of the influence of Calliope and also well of Apollo, who's god of poetry and music, he is known for his singing voice. He is known for his ability to move people with his beautiful voice. And uh, he is about to get married. But <laughs> right as we are right as this marriage is announced, we are told that the bride, who has not yet been named, curiously, uh, who has not yet been named, is bitten on the ankle or bitten on the foot uh, by a snake and dies. <laughs> and uh, that's kind of funny because after the previous, uh, the previous wedding, the previous marriage of uh, uh, Iphis and Iante, where the wedding had been uh, postponed so many times and pushed back and was this build up, oh, will they get married? Won't they get married? Oh, when will the magic day come? Oh, not yet, not yet, not yet. And there was so much tension built around that, that to suddenly have, you know, a wedding day and we're, again, the bride is not personalized by a name just yet, but to suddenly have that wedding day and, uh, and, and, and the bride dies, <laughs> It's a funny contrast. It's it's a it's one of those little twists that Ovid so delights in uh, in in pulling on his readers. But the uh, the death does hit Orpheus quite hard. Orpheus is uh, is given to a little self pity, and he is wallowing in that. Uh, but well, that's that's probably that's probably unfair. Uh, accounting for uh, a love that is very genuine, he is uh, he is quite emotionally destroyed by this in a way that is uh, very internal <clears throat> and remarkably sophisticated in characterization because the ancient world is not known for a lot of internal deliberation, a lot of internal conflict or the processing of it. So when you have uh, Orpheus who is really struggling with something emotional, that's a, uh, that is a, uh, not entirely new, but significant um, development in the story of, uh, of literature. Um, so he gets the idea to go and, uh, see her in the underworld and he goes down and he, uh, he sees, uh, Pluto and Proserpina and whatever, and, uh, and makes a case that they should give her a second chance, that they should release her. And he makes this case in song and remember his voice is beautiful and everything and uh it uh it, it 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 is quite moving to them and the case he makes is fairly uh direct and and even strikes a fairly dark note we are all owed to you hell uh or the underworld death we are all owed to you wholly and through and though we may linger Later or sooner, all hasten to this single dwelling. Everyone heads to this place, 
the home that is final curiously uh, hammering that home. Now, he's creating some drama in his song. He's creating some uh, uh, some sense of depth. Uh, and he's trying to hammer home the point that finality is, uh, is something quite serious. But is he making that case purely to, uh, to lend some credence to his case? Is it purely a rhetorical exercise? Or is this something that he's dwelling on himself? The idea that death is inescapable. The idea that death hunts us all down. Um, well, you know, this is, uh, this is a significant point. This is a significant theme throughout ancient literature. And you can see him not really taking a side on this. Is it rhetorical? Is it purely for effect? Or is it something that he is actually thinking. How much credence do you want to give his sincerity? Uh, that will color how you see everything that follows with him after that, and really everything right up until the very last line of this poem, um, where the, the idea of immortality is suggested through art. And that's what he's vying for here. Um, well, he's vying for himself, for art. Uh, and, well, his case works. They are swayed. These words accompanied by the plucked strings so moved the bloodless spirits that they wept. Tantalus did not seek the receding waters on his, and on his wheel lay Ixion astounded. The birds let go their liver and the daughters of Danius were resting by, it, by their urns while you, O Sisyphus, sat on your stone. So it's a little, uh, he's, he's not just, uh, Orpheus is not just affecting the two focused uh, on the throne right there, but rather the entire uh, the entire mythical world of the underworld. Uh, all of these great heroes who are being punished there eternally. So it gives him uh, again a little bit more rhetorical uh, oomph to his uh, uh, to the song. Um, but that's Ovid giving it to him, saying, "Okay, this this was not just any song. This was appealing to everybody." Uh, and they agree. Orpheus is allowed to take his wife, Eurydice, out of death. But there is a condition. He can lead the way out. He can lead her out of the, the cave, as it essentially is in this construction, uh, lead her out. But he has to walk first. And he cannot look behind. He can't look behind or else it's all over. And he agrees. Okay, fine. Goodbye. And he starts walking out and Eurydice is following him. He started out upon the soundless path that rises steeply through the dense fog and darkness until they had come almost to the border of the upper earth. Here Orpheus, afraid that she would fail him, and desiring a glimpse of his beloved, turned to look. At once she slipped back to the underworld, and he, because he wanted to embrace her, or be embraced by her, stretched out his arms, but seized on nothing, that unlucky man, unless it was the abnegating heir. Heartbreak. Heartbreak moment right there. Uh, he's failed. He has failed in his mission. Now, there are a couple of things going on here. One, uh, the soundless path. He is known for sound, so he is in a very alien territory here, and it's perhaps something that he is not particularly good at. He cannot uh, do anything with that. Um, but he desires a glimpse of his beloved, and he can't resist. Other writers will take this up. He can't resist looking back when that was the one condition he had for the success of his mission. He can't resist. He is essentially weak in this moment. It is his failing. But it's also driven by love for Eurydice. We're told that. He, 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 he can't resist looking back. He is insanely curious about this to make sure she's there. Maybe he's doubting her. 
maybe. Maybe he doesn't really have the, uh, the faith in her that he should, but also because he loves her and he wants to see her. That double bind, again, the, always the internal and the external is, is, is torturing this character and twisting him around, and he doesn't know where to go with it. So he ends up failing at the one condition that he had. And that, uh, that, that image of the embrace that becomes nothing, uh, one that, uh, that, uh, Odysseus faces, uh, when he goes to embrace his mother three times in the underworld and she slips through his fingers and, uh, and, and Aeneas is going to have the same, uh, the same thing, the embrace that turns up nothing when the spirit flees with the body and you embrace nothing. It's, it's a powerful image. Now, um, as a condition, of course, Eurydice is gone forever. Orpheus goes back to, uh, goes back to the upper world and is destroyed. He is a wreck. He is just leveled by this, leveled by his failure and the loss of his love. It's, it's that double bind again. He goes and he wanders around in, in a kind of uh, desolate fog. Orpheus prayed, desiring in vain to cross the river Styx a second time, but was prevented by the border guards. For seven days he sat by the river's banks, unkempt, unshaven, and unfed, with naught but care and sorrow for his nourishment. Complaining that the gods below were cruel, he sought out the lofty hope. The, he sought out lofty Rhodope and Hamus, two mountains in Thrace, his homeland, and he, he's wandering the wilderness. He's just leveled. He's just destroyed. He has lost his love. The love that he felt for her has been so overwhelming, so overpowering, it has destroyed him. It has changed him. And from there, Ovid takes it in a slightly new direction, uh, not all that new. Three times the sun had finished out the year in Pisces of the waters. Orpheus had fled completely from the love of women, either because it hadn't worked for him or else because the pledge that he had given to his Eurydice was permanent. Notice that Eurydice is concretized into a name here. She is taking on firm uh, characteristics as she is only in his mind at this point, his memory, memory. No matter, women burn to have the bard and many suffer greatly from rejection. Among the Thracians, he originated the practice of transferring the affections to youthful males, plucking the first flower in the brief springtime of their early manhood. Uh, and here, Ovid is saying that he was so leveled, so changed by the experience of love and loss that uh, it rewired him sexually. Um, he, uh, he then became gay. Uh, this is interesting in that Ovid is taking this. He, he, well, he's, he is charting a kind of internal change again. It's not just a change in circumstances for, uh, for uh, Orpheus. This is a change inside himself. The power of love and the power of frustrated love and frustrated sexual desire and the pain of that frustration has changed him on the inside. Uh, that is the dramatic, uh, art, uh, that is the art of drama that we will see play out for the, for all of, uh, modern literature, modern meaning starting with the Romans right here. Honestly, the idea that people can change and people, uh, can be, and well, the, and the idea that love and sexual desire itself is so overwhelming a force as to uh, to compel change. Interestingly, Ovid does put this in a kind of historical context. He says that this is the point that uh, uh, he originated the practice 
uh, Orpheus originated the practice of essentially pederasty of, of older uh, older male figures taking on younger uh, young boys, adolescent boys, and using uh, and getting out their uh, their sexual drive uh, in that way, uh, which is generally. Uh, viewed in the um, in the elite Roman uh, culture of the time as a uh, as, as a bit of a uh, an, an off-putting part of the Greek inheritance that they were so uh, ambivalent about sometimes or so troubled about uh, the anxiety of influence perhaps here Ovid is saying well no that's what began that uh that practice and there you can see him putting a kind of uh historical marker on decadence for lack of a better term where he is saying all right the story has moved along we have gotten through the creation of the universe. We have gotten through the age of heroes. We have gotten through a lot of that. And now we are firmly in the human world of time, where suddenly there is an event in time that shapes our culture today. And that culture for him is Rome. And he's looking around and he's seeing that, well, yeah, okay, um, there is, an awful lot of pederasty still practiced. He doesn't necessarily condemn it. He doesn't necessarily say that it's wrong or anything. Uh, he leaves it more or less up for your consideration. But he is putting that out there. And he's saying... This is part of the continuum of human evolution. This is part of the continuum of human emotion. And it is, like everything else, something that you cannot turn away from. You need to understand and get your head around all of it if you're going to understand humanity. And that's what he's charting here. Remember, this is an epic poem. This is the story of a single figure through experience. And that single figure is humanity writ large, the existence of human beings from their pre-existence, when it's just matter, through divine interactions. And now we're getting much more historical, much more grounded in reality as we know it, much more human centered. Because here we have a drama that is entirely human. There is no uh, magical transformation. He doesn't turn into a tree or anything like that. He turns into a different version of himself. And you can say that, well, you know, there were elements, maybe, you know, ah, he always wanted to, or, you know, he was faking it beforehand. Maybe. But again, that's all the drama within him. There is no miracle here. Unless you count the visit to hell. But all of the drama, all of the real change, that's going on in his heart. 